Okay. Uh, maybe this uh, first session was not taped for those of you who watched this. Not for you, but for... And, uh, and then you should just read the lecture notes, I think. And from now on we will uh, tape this session. Um, so you get the point here that there is a demand effect and there is a cost effect. Both of them contribute to the pecuniary external effects, which we actually measure here, because this will be the price changes in the market for all players in the market. And this shift is just a marginal cost shift because it will be, it is assumed that it will be cheaper to produce each unit as a, as a result of this uh, increased competition. Um, <clears throat> so we are not focusing on input-output linkages, as you had from this uh, input-output session, uh, I think it was lecture three or something, where we, s we are studying <laughs> demand from one sector on all the other sectors, but we are focusing on the link between profitability, costs and the size of the market, as I have said now, and the previous figure is, uh, is kind of the core of to, to the understanding of this, these mechanisms. So, and this is what I already said, that uh, the that, uh, size of this economic system is, is kind of what we are, what we are addressing. So, we talk about, and that is something that has been attracting research activities, the critical mass of an economic system. And we'll talk, I'll expand on that critical mass issue next, next week. But uh, because critical mass is, uh, is crucial, because if this system exceeds the critical mass point, and that can be measured in terms of number of companies, number of citizens, number of companies within a specific industry, and so on, we can expect these nice pecuniary effects and also the technical effects to take place. If we don't reach the critical mass point, then <coughs> very little will happen in terms of uh, self-reinforcing growth. But uh, I'll discuss that more, more uh, next time. If <coughs> new entries is positively linked with the existing firms, and then we have this, uh, this, this cost and demand effects. And then we are back to this Myrdal's cumulative causation model, where we, I can just go back. Because what we have discussed here is the nature of these external economies. The first step to understand the nature of those externalities was the endogenous growth theory. And then new economic geography has contributed with this demand and cost shift effect because of the increased size of the economic system. It says localizing of new firms here in this, uh, in this framework, but you could also translate that or, uh, or interpret that as linking two systems together, which has previously been weakly linked together. Then. That will work in the same way as if you get a lot of new companies coming in. And this is uh, also something that I have been touching upon. Um, this, uh, what we call label pooling, which means uh, this, uh, this ben the, the benefits of sharing the labor force. And here there is a numerical example where two firms <coughs> demand 25 in 125 
people in the peak periods and 75 people in the off-peak periods of demand for their products or services. And they are in, the, in, the, they are in counter cyclical in nature. When the peak is for one, the other, the other one is an off-peak. And then you can see that uh, if we have 200 uh, man years here, that, that will be sufficient. If, if uh, at the extreme case where the one where the firms in the no off peak period can can uh, can give off uh, people to to the other company, but peak in the, at the same time would make them run out of labor. So uh, <coughs> if they are located in separate regions, they will not be able to cover the top the peak, and then, uh, then, uh, then it will uh, run out of capacity. I studied this <coughs> once, way back, many years back, uh, in a system which is not too far from here. Um, it's a small island outside of the city of Ålesund, and I also studied uh, labor pooling phenomenon in, in the area outside Bergen. Tried to find out whether new fixed links had changed the way companies used their labor force. And uh, I found one occurrence here where one company traded labor with another company located on the mainland, these are islands. And the ferry services closed at night time. So they were not able to run 24 7 shifts as long as the ferries were running, but they could do it after the fixed link had, uh, had come into place. And hence, you increase productivity. And if that, if that takes place <coughs> at a larger scale, I don't think you can get much quantifiable economic benefits out of one company starting like this, perhaps some. But if this takes place at a larger scale, you might get something out of it. Outside of Bergen, we didn't find anything of that. And this, the, the, the reason was quite simple. And that is also a very important point to underline here. These two labor markets on the mainland and on the islands were complementary. They had benefits of being linked together. In this area, the nature of the industry on the, out on the islands here differed so much from what you could find on the mainland. So they had no benefits, at least not at the time of the study. Of, uh, of cooperating uh, to, to do interchange of, of, of labor. So that is what researchers say, all, keep saying all the time when we deal with this type of added economic benefits of transport infrastructure. You need to be very aware of the characteristics of the study area. So to transfer experience or results from one area to another can be done, but you should be extremely careful when doing it. So, and I can try to be specific. If you have a situation where you study one specific industry, like for instance the shipbuilding industry, and you see that in one area you can say that a new link, fixed link, or a new transport link will give a, um, a benefit of a certain magnitude per man hour or per man year because of increased productivity effects. And if you then have a similar type of industry in another area and you get a comparable improvement in the, in the transport system, it's fair to transfer the effect, the, the experiences from one 
industry in one area to a similar industry in another area. All other things being fairly equal. So we need to avoid comparing apples and bananas here. We need to try to keep track of the comparability of, uh, of the regions that you are studying if you tr choose to transfer empirical evidence from one place to another. So, <coughs> uh, driving forces uh, for concentration of activities. That is what we are discussing. You have, of course, the natural facilities which also was indicated in this, uh, in this Myrdal cumulonacrization model. You have these market-driven external effects, which we talked about. Uh, you have these linkages, which takes place of varying degrees, of course, but they are rooted in, in this pecuniary externality uh, mechanism. And then, in addition, the, the quality and the size and the diversity of the labor market. And if the transport system can contribute <coughs> to a change in these factors, you, you may have a kind of a case for, for, a, for a study. Some of you who are, uh, who are writing your, uh, your uh, term papers or essays, you're dealing with um, ports here, which in many regions is an engine for, for uh, let's say, boosting economic activity. Yeah. But you may also have <coughs> factors for spreading of activities, and these may be called counteracting forces. And if you remember back to the Myrdal lecture a couple of weeks ago, I touched upon this counteracting effects. So, when you don't have increasing returns to scale anymore, but you are starting to get an upward pointing average cost curve because you run into capacity problems. Because what is said here is that now we are facing capacity problems in the system. Be it lack of transport capacity, lack of uh, housing so that uh, the real estate prices are, are rocketing as we see now currently in the, in the Oslo area in this country. Then we have a counteracting force, which can cancel out the nice productivity effects of, uh, of, of improvements and relocation effects. So when, uh, when, when the Oslo area is expected to grow with some 20% of the population or the increasing population is expected to be around 20% for the next 10 years. Not too much if you compare with Chinese numbers, but anyway, it's quite a lot. And if you then are currently, that is today, facing capacity problems, then you can experience or expect that this, this population growth will simply not take place. It will be too expensive for people to, to, to live here. So that is why politicians and uh, planners are doing whatever they can to, to try to expand, let's say, housing capacity, which is at the moment the bottleneck. The transport capacity problems will occur sooner or later, but they are not the very hot topic at the moment because the transport capacity in, in, in that specific city has been expanded quite a lot. Goes with this negative external effects that you get costs, so social costs or economic costs connected to congestion and, and pollution. And another <coughs> driving force for spreading or 
not concentrating economic activities is the amount of immobile resources in production. Agriculture is one typical example. It's not easy to move farms to, to Oslo. But perhaps more relevant is that if you have a local strong industry cluster, a real, let's say, a real industry cluster as we have described here, like the electromechanical industry in this area. That resource base, which is this cluster, may be immobile, at least in the short run. And if it is way below the critical mass size, sorry, way above the critical mass size, but it is big and robust, it's not easy to attract companies away from that cluster because it's so profitable to be a member of it and to be located within it, geographically speaking. But if the cluster is balancing on the critical mass point, real bad things can happen if the forces for concentration attracts, let's say, two or three companies of a certain size away from a cluster, then the whole thing may collapse. And you go, or collapse, not very momentarily, but during some years, this cluster may, may contract itself by means of the same forces as we have discussed. But then, in the opposite direction. If companies move away from a cluster, demand contracts, competition goes perhaps in the wrong direction, cost increases, scale disadvantages, prices increase, and there you go, you just turn a good, prosperous way of developing the region into a vicious circle like the steel industry in South Africa and uh, so on, the defense industry in former Eastern Germany, as I mentioned last time, where the, activi the economic activity contracts itself instead of, of, of expanding. So this is, uh, of course, uh, it goes without too much elaboration that the battle between centripetal concentration and the centrifugal forces is there and they need to be balanced. And uh, that is something that is a challenge in, in many, many urban areas. I think some of you comes from Brazil, and I think uh, you're from Brazil, do you? Yeah. And some of your bigger cities has faced this problem for a long time, like Sao Paulo, for instance, where uh, people migrate in to, s to, to apply for work and, and they are uh, faced with a lot of uh, centrifugal forces, which causes a lot of people to stay, but, uh, but with, uh, with, with problems. In a country like, uh, like, um, like this one, perhaps, you, will, you can at best observe this battle as a kind of a as I mentioned last time, a periodic wave between centralization and a bit of outmigration from the cities. And uh, because of a diverse location of industries and perhaps also a generous uh, way of, uh, 
of compensating re re remote regions or rural areas. You can have this situation going on without too much, let's say, uh, negative welfare effects for, for people. Whereas in, in other areas it's, it may be highly problem, prob problematic, this, this battle where the centrifugal forces is what we normally would consider as adverse to, to, to people, congestion and pollution and what have you. In some areas you can move away from that, in other areas you cannot. That's the baseline of that reasoning. So, uh, transport costs in this. Um, and this is kind of a mixed picture. You can, you, we are in, in this new economic geography, transport costs are important in explaining concentration. That is another uh, world word for uh, agglomeration. Uh, but the higher the transport costs are, the larger the concentration tends to be because it is costly to transport things and then both the end user market and the suppliers will tend to concentrate. And, uh, and that is uh, what we see in, 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 in many countries that, that uh, because of weak infrastructure, inter-regional infrastructure for instance, there is a tendency of concentration. And uh, it goes with this, that if the conditions are poor in terms of having a good connection between regions, the, the tolerance for, uh, for living with congestion and all kinds of uh, capacity problems is, is higher. Uh, <coughs> so a weak transport network outside of the bigger cities may co contribute to centralization. I think this is, uh, it makes sense also for, uh, for Norway. I showed you this uh, illustration last, last time with a high degree of centralization, which fits in time quite nicely together with large transport packages implemented in the, in the bigger Norwegian cities, which are not really big, but anyway. So Bergen, Trondheim, Oslo, and partly Stavanger and other areas as well, has benefited from large improvements in transport infrastructure. So it's been quite, quite good conditions for the, for the citizens. And that is a concentrating or a sentry petal force, which can, I think it has contributed to, to centralization in this country, even if I cannot prove it scientifically. If one location in the network has lower costs of access to the others, the, that node may grow at the expense of the others. And that has to do with the scale effects. And you have to remember that when we talk about costs diminishing or increasing returns to scale, a part of the production costs is also, the, the transport costs is also part of the production costs in that illustration. Because transport is an obviously a, a production factor in this. So <coughs> if one region has a head start in terms of having a better system, it may grow and have a self-perpetuating growth at the expense of, of the surrounding regions. So what, what we learn from this is that one should invest in transport infrastructure also in, in rural areas to, to, to ensure a, a kind of balance. Of course, given the, the resource base that is there in these areas and on interurban systems and not only focus on urban infrastructure. And the, and the thing worth paying attention to here is that the policy that you choose causes path dependency.
That means simply that once you have gotten the concentration with all the problems that may occur, concentration to, uh, let's say, a few urban areas, that is the situation in, 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 in some countries, it's very hard to reverse this. It's because then, the, the, let's say, the economic activity in the regions, the, in the rural or remote regions, is not there because everything is taking place in the cities. And then you cannot, so you cannot go back so easily. It's very hard to do that. So I think, or I hope, that that observation is uh, kind of in the heads or in the minds of some, uh, some Chinese planners. Because they are really facing uh, a big migration flow from inland areas and to the, to the cities uh, along the coastline. Transport infrastructure investment in urban areas, good, if balanced with, uh, with increasing returns to scale in production capacity. It's bad if it drains productive capacity in remote areas so that overall productivity is reduced. And then I'm talking about, let's say, from a pure economic efficiency point of view. Because if you, <coughs> what I'm saying here is that if a well-functioning industry cluster in this area is destroyed in the slightly longer run because, uh, because um, the migration flows goes towards the city, the, the central areas. That might cause a, an overall reduction in the, in, the, uh, in the overall productivity. Particularly if the costs of congestion is not inc included in the price that the users of, let's say, an urban transport network pays for, the, for, uh, for using, uh, let's say, an urban road network. What I'm saying is that if you invest in urban areas without charging the true costs of using the transport network, you will most certainly overinvest in urban infrastructure and then you can actually drain out productive activity from the, from the regions. I've tried to say this, actually I have said it directly to the, to the Norwegian parliament because they invited me to, to give a speech on, on, uh, on this topic. And I'm afraid that uh, it will take some time <laughs> before they listen to this. <laughs> because it's simple, I mean, the lion's share of the, uh, of the voters are located in urban areas. And if a political, par a political party says that, well, to avoid this type of effects, we should introduce road pricing in urban areas. You shouldn't have too much of imagination to, to, to foresee what will happen with that, pol with that political party in the next election. They will probably be wiped out of the parliament, or at least the number of, uh, of delegates will be significantly reduced. So, so they, won't, they tend not to propose such, uh, let's say, unpopular measures to avoid this. So, <coughs> in um, infrastructures between poor and rich regions, uh, in short term, positive effects and the EO stands for input output multiplier studies. It creates a lot of activity, which is good. 
but um, but it's uh, it's complex long-term effects because if you open up for flows between a poor and a rich re region and if you remember back to what I said about balance between trade partners you men may end up in, in a situation where the poor region will not be able to survive as an economic system and uh, a very practical example of that is the local shop and the local uh, school some and several places in Norway which has been uh, closed down because of improved infrastructure, improved accessibility. So people tend to just drive to the next city and so on. So, uh, <coughs> but this may also go in uh, in in both directions. That uh, you can you can really export cheaper products to to the poor region and um, and uh, make it as a counteracting centripetal force to, to say, stay in the region and commute instead of moving. And I'm, I'm quite interested in studying how air transport can play a role in this in, in, in Norway, because we have a very diversified air transport system. Uh, some of you have been uh, discussing that in, in, in a Brazilian context as well. And uh, I will not exclude the possibility that that system has a quite important function in, in keeping up the regional balance between, uh, between remoter and more, uh, more urban areas. So, and this a combination between global transport costs and better public welfare inside of poor regions uh, could also attract activity to, to uh, poor, poor regions. Of course problems if the workforce chooses to stay and the firms move. I know some people who commute with air transport on a daily basis to Oslo. That is an example of this. Instead of taking the bike or the car or the bus to, jo to, to work every day, they use the aircraft. I think, be my guest, I would say. And yeah, so this is just a few, a few slides to, to say something about um, European conditions. This is uh, from around 2000 and uh, Eight, where we see the geographic income uh, inequality uh, here, where the darker the darker uh, boxes are uh, low income areas. So <coughs> we see that within nations, also economic activity can be very unevenly distributed. Uh, and also between nations. The bigger cities, Norway is not a part of EU, so that's why it's not, uh, not included in the map. But we see that, uh, for instance, in Sweden, the high income area is, uh, is around Stockholm, the capital. In the UK, you have London here. In France, you have Paris here and so on. Italy has a very, uh, let's say, pronounced pattern of inequality. And you can also see that when if you study Italian politics, they tend to, tends to be a very sharp frontier between the north and the south in Italy. And you can see it from that map. They have quite different uh, let's say again this po policy wise and uh, <coughs> I just show you this as an example of uh, policy rooted in growth theory and this is uh, the EU structural fun funds and you can recognize some of the logic 
There is a logic behind these three objectives, which we recognize now from, uh, from uh, the growth theory. Uh, try to, uh, <coughs> try to uh, increase the attractivity of lagging regions to maintain and perhaps also preferably strengthen the, the economic activity level. Um, the same here, try to amend areas with high long-term unemployment or, and high poverty levels to bring them up to, let's say, a, a level where a self perpetuating growth pattern can, can take place instead of being on the wishes circles, wishes circle side of things. And this is clearly addressed towards this endogenous growth theory of uh, labor productivity. So <coughs> this is uh, just this is the final slide on this section. Uh, shows the you um, have seen it before perhaps the the world at night, and you can see where the agglomeration effects and the concentration of economic activity takes place. We find uh, some Brazilian cities, the U.S. particularly in the east. And you have California here, which is a very strong economy, also globally. And you have Europe. There are even some lights in, 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 uh, in Molde, but most of them are in, in Oslo, in the Oslo area. And this is from, uh, I think it's from 2005, so it would have been nice to have a comparative photo from 2015 to compare. I would guess that There are more lights along this Chinese coastline and perhaps not so much inside uh, in the inland as, as it was in 2005. Okay, then I think we break and uh, I will proceed with uh, wider economic impacts after the break. <laughs>